The book of James is an interesting book. It was written by the man who was the pastor of the Jerusalem church for many, many years. Now, the early church faced many obstacles as they sought to carry out the Great Commission. That was true in every part of the Mediterranean. Everywhere that Paul started a church, there was difficulty. There were problems that those members were going to face. So it was across this, the entire spectrum, but it, it was especially true in Jerusalem. That's where the Jewish opposition was headquartered. The very same people that um, had executed Jesus. The very same people who had killed other disciples. Those people were still in Jerusalem. And they were still, they still had a bad attitude. Let me put it down. <laughs> so it was a tough place to be. And it's clear in the scripture that James had a highly visible role in the church. And I say this because I read some scholars who were trying to um, say he was just a part of the group of elders. But I think there's some scriptures that indicate that he was more than just that. And the Bible does say that he was an apostle. We'll come to some of those things in just a moment. But until the time that he was actually martyred himself, and we know that because of Flavius Josephus, the famous Jewish historian, yes. who tells the story of James being executed. And, and there are some who say that he was tossed from the top of the temple down to the concrete ground, not concrete, but stone uh, flooring below. But that it didn't kill him. And so they went down there and took mallets and stones and just beat him to death. This is a man who knew Jesus better than anybody else, correct? Yes. Yeah. He was his brother. He yeah. was raised in the same household. Can you imagine being raised in the household with Jesus as one of your siblings? I mean, it would be great, but the pressure on you because you would always look like the ugly duckling. You know what I'm saying? Right. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 9, James is referred to as one of the pillars of the church. Listen to this. And recognizing the grace that has been given to me, James and Cephas and John, who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship so that we might go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. So the Apostle Paul wrote that passage, but he's referring to James, Cephas, and John, and he says they are reputed to be pillars of the church. So he had a prominent role in the church. Would you agree? Yes. Say yes, that's good. <laughs> Acts chapter 21, verse 18. And the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. Was James just one of the elders? If so, why does the text specifically state, we went in to James, and the elders were present? After he had greeted them, he began to relate one by one the things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. So the Apostle Paul had enough regard for James to believe that he should report on what God was doing in the ministry to the Gentile world, to the mother church. Yeah. And the first person that he wanted to report to, report to was James. Yes? Yes. Acts 15, verse 13. And after they had stopped speaking, James answered, saying, Brethren, listen to me. Yes. Now, I'm not going to read the whole passage because i got other things to deal with today. <laughs> but that passage has to do with the Gentiles being saved and Jewish believers saying, Hey, they have to become Jews before they can become Christians. And there was a big conflict that broke out about that. They went to the church in Jerusalem to talk about it and pray about it. And once all the cards were on the table, and it's just a figure of state, you know what I'm saying. Figure of state. Figure of speech. Thank you so much. I'm old. I stayed up till 1.30 in the morning watching my football team. I can't help it. I've been following them since I was in junior high. And they played till 1.30 in the morning. Oh, Triple overtime game. I was praying, Lord, please don't let it go into another overtime. 
<laughs> so once they presented all the information, James stood up and said, Brethren, listen to me. And he stated to them exactly how the Gentile believers would be received into the church. So he's not just one of the guys. He is a prominent voice in the early church. Would you agree? Sure, yes. So James wrote his letter to the early church as a pastoral address. He doesn't say very much in the letter as a matter of introduction. He just, intro he just says who he is. He knows that the people that he's writing to will know who he is. So he doesn't give them some law. I got my degrees over here and I pastored over here and I've got this great background. None of that. No. Just James and who he was writing to. So he wrote this from a pastoral perspective, and there is a certain perspective that pastors have on the work of God, because they are involved in it in a way that a lot of people are not. And they take some of the heat that some of the rest of the church members do not. It's just the way it is. And I've never met a pastor who wouldn't agree with that. Oh, yeah. Because it's not always an easy life. Now, with you guys, I mean, you're angels, so I'm not worried about that. But, but the reality is, in many churches right now, there are pastors preaching in churches, and there's conflict throughout the fellowship, and he knows it. And some of it's being directed toward him. It's the nature of the beast, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So he was writing about issues... Uh, personally from the speaker's platform, but the Holy Spirit led him to address certain things, certain prominent things that were affecting their lives. And he wanted to help them, to encourage them to deal with those things. And so he wrote it down for future generations so that you and I could know that one of these days this is going to fall through. <laughs> it squeaks now when I stand here. You say, well, lose weight, Pastor. Easier said than done. Fix the floor. That's right. Uh, so, he pastored in the very city where I told you where Jesus was executed and all these things took place. The Romans were still there, were they not? Yes. They were still willing to throw Christians off a rooftop if they needed to. The Sanhedrin was still there. They weren't any nicer than they were when Jesus was executed. And the temple was there, so all of the really traditional Jewish people, they were in that place. Mm -hmm. And James was dealing with them on a regular basis. It was a very dangerous and hostile city for Christians to live in. They were in danger every day. And that became more evident as time went on. Acts chapter 8, verse 1. Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. Where did the persecution begin? Jerusalem. In Jerusalem. In the church. And then it spread from there. But those who were living in Jerusalem, who were newly converted to the Christian faith, found themselves in a very precarious situation. Because there were a lot of people out there in their neighborhood, and the temple was a prominent place for them to go. A lot of uh, businesses took place out on the patio around the temple, so this was a, a place where Jewish people hung out. It was dangerous for them, and not easy at all. So Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death, and on that day a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Now, there were some church members still there, too. And that's the group that James was ministering to on a regular basis. Danger? Yes. Did he know that? Absolutely. So why did he begin his letter with a discussion of trials? Because he knew that so many of his people were going through severe trials. <coughs> right? Right. So that's why he just cut to the quick. Let's just get right to it. And he jumps right in talking about trials and temptations. James chapter 1, verse 1. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's something for him to say, the Lord Jesus Christ. Yep. Raised in the home with Jesus. He was not a believer that Jesus was the promised Messiah for many years. 
until Jesus died and resurrected and met him one day on the road and said, hey, by the way, James, just one day I would visit with you. And he went, oh, my. You must be, yes, I am. James became a believer. And a very well-established believer at that point. To the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. To 12 tribes. The 12 tribes refers to Israel, does it not? Yeah, right. He's a Jew. He's living in, in Israel. He's living in, Ju in Jerusalem. And he wants to talk to Christian believers who are being scattered. Why are they being scattered? Because of the persecution. Because of the things that are happening to them and their family members. And so he wants to talk to them. Now, no one wants to go through severe trials, correct? No one wants to face that, and so you see this picture here, and this guy has a forked road. If he goes down one road, there's trials, troubles, storms waiting for him. Do you follow my illustration? Yeah. If he goes the other way, it's the Las Vegas of the ancient world, all the fun that you could ever want to have, and everything will be relaxed and comfortable for you. So he opens his letter with the recognition of these two major issues, trials and temptation. Both of those things were facing his members on a daily basis. No one wants to go through it. I don't want to go through trials, do you? I'd much rather take an easier road, wouldn't you? Yeah. It's much better if you can just stay out of the... Conflict. Our natural tendency would be to avoid trials and to try to make sure that we stay away from people who create those kinds of problems. I mean, I don't, I don't go anywhere and say, hey, where's the person who causes most of the trouble in this room? I want to meet that person. I want to talk to you. Well, not necessarily. Where's the sweetest person in the room? I'd like to meet them and feel welcome first before anything else goes on. Our natural tendency would be to try to avoid trials and choose a more comfortable path in life. But if we take a public stand for faith, that might not be afforded to us. The road of faithfulness will endure hardship. There are storms on the horizon. Oh, yes. The road of compromise would reduce that pressure, would allow us a certain degree of pleasure. Fun, relaxation, no difficulties whatsoever. Now, you don't have to be openly hostile to the Christian faith. A person can just be silent while Christians are suffering. Mm -hmm. And they certainly don't appear to be your friend, correct? They just let it go on. James recognized there'd be two prominent voices in the ears of these believers, and that's still true today. The first voice is the voice of the Holy Spirit, represented by the dove in that picture. The Holy Spirit of God speaks to his people, and whatever circumstance we find ourselves in, God is speaking to us. He speaks through his word. Yes, he does. But the Holy Spirit communicates with us through the Word of God. And the Holy Spirit stays with us even when you don't have an open Bible in your hand or you can't think of that passage that would be perfect for the situation you're facing. In all of those things, the Holy Spirit is still there. He's still communicating with you if you will just listen to Him. So there's the voice of the Holy Spirit. We're not left without direction, without wisdom or encouragement. Correct? Correct. Okay. And the Holy Spirit wants us to stay on course. He wants us to live the life of faith. Then there's another voice represented by that serpent in the roadway there. The serpent always lies to us. He lies to us. He lies about God. He lies about God's word. He lies about the situations that we're facing and where we're going to find the most peace. He says, go to the fun place, go to the fun place, that's better for you. He's always prompting us to do the wrong thing. The devil does not like us. He's not our friend. He is our foe. And he wants to destroy our Christian life if he possibly can. So let's go back to James chapter 1 and look at verse 2. 
Consider it joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Now that's just out of la-la land, isn't it? I mean, seriously. When you're going through trials, do you say, oh, I can't wait to get up this morning and go see that idiot next door because he's always so obnoxious to me. Today I'm going to have to deal with him. I'm so excited about that. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for today. Yes? No. No, not normally. Normally we look at it in a different way. Various trials, the word trial. It's a word which means adversity, affliction, and trouble. And the Bible mentions various kinds. And the kind of troubles you face may not be the kinds of troubles that someone else across the room is facing. But I can guarantee you one thing. As long as the devil is still active, there will be trials and difficulties for Christians to face. It's just the way it is. So trials means adversity, affliction, and trouble, and testing is something by which you are proven to be true. Amen. By going through trials, you prove that your faith is genuine and sincere. You never go through trials and no one really knows if your faith is really heartfelt because it's never been put to the test, yes? Mm -hmm. yes? Nothing appealing to me about adversity, affliction, or trouble. I'd like to resist it whenever possible. Prefer to live a quiet life, as quiet as I can be. <laughs> I suspect James felt the same way sometimes. Well, I'd like to have one really nice, easy day when there's nothing really terrible going on. But no, there's a very sound spiritual lesson to be learned here. How should we respond to trials? And that's what I'm about to share with you this morning. How should you respond when you are going through a very trying time? Heartache, grief, you've lost a loved one, you've lost your job, whatever might be going on. But when you're going through that, how should you respond to it? Now, trial is a test, and tests can be passed. And I'm going to give you the keys to success in handling trials in your own life. If trials never come your way, then you don't have to listen to this sermon at all. You can go to lunch early. But if you ever face trials, then maybe this is for you. Number one, embrace it. Consider it joy. Isn't that what he said? That's right. Embrace the trial. Okay, Lord, I understand. I'm going through a hard time right now. This is an opportunity for me to grow in my faith. And as much as I would rather grow in my faith, fishing out on a peaceful body of water where it's beautiful, that's not always what we have. We have storms and all this other stuff. And I just need to embrace it. I need to quit complaining and whining about it. And I need to just get my mindset that this is going to strengthen my character. James chapter 1, verse 2. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. How do you get endurance if you are a runner? You run. And the more you run, the more your endurance grows. How do you produce endurance? If you're a baseball player, you play baseball. You spend hours and hours and hours in the batting cage. I know that because I lived that life for many years. And how do you grow? By practicing. How does a Christian grow? By dealing with hardships and learning to walk with God. So we embrace it, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. You can be perfect. No, I can't. Yes, you can. Now let me explain what perfect means. Because that word means perfect toward a given end. Perfect for what it was created for. Are you with me? And the best example I ever heard about this, and you've heard that you may say this at times in the past, but I'll say it again too, because I can repeat myself because I'm old. <laughs> it's when I forget those stories and I can't remember, that's when you have a problem. This guy had this pickup truck out on his farm. 
And he drove into town one day, and he was doing some shopping, and some guy came along and said, man, that's got to be the ugliest pickup truck I've ever seen. <laughs> he said, you got to be kidding. That thing's perfect. He said, perfect? Well, it smells for one thing, and it looks filthy, and it's, just, it's ridiculous. It looks terrible. The farmer said, oh, no, no. This truck is perfect. You see, it had these two 50-gallon drums on the back of the pickup truck. And there was a lever that he had right next to the driver's window. He could pull that lever, and those big barrels would just tip over like this. Well, see, he had a lot of pigs on his farm. And I've seen people feed the pigs, and it's a sloppy job. <laughs> he could just back up his pickup truck, pull the lever, and the pigs were fed. And then he would lift them back up with the lever and drive back to the farmhouse. That truck was perfect. It did exactly what it was designed to do. Let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect, lacking in nothing, so that you can be everything God intended for you to be. Yeah. How do we get there? Trials. Wish there was another road. Trials are a good thing, so consider it joy. It's an opportunity for spiritual growth. Hardship promotes endurance. Maybe God is allowing this in order to build your strength and your character. Maybe God sees some areas where you are weak and you need to be bolstered in that area of your life. And so he brings some specific trials along that will help you to be stronger in that area. He knows exactly what he's doing. He knows exactly what he wants you to do in response so that it will help you to grow and mature and be the person God wants you to be. Well-rounded and perfect in every possible way to serve God. Embrace the trial. Face it with a positive attitude. Oh, Lord, things are getting tough. Thank you so much. It just shows me that you love me and you still have room for me in your kingdom. And help me to deal with this in the right manner. God could be allowing this to strengthen you and deepen your personal testimony. And you do have a testimony before those around you when you go through hardship and you do it to the glory of God. They see something in you that they don't have. And suddenly your testimony becomes much more impressive to them. Hardship leads us to spiritual maturity. Dealing with it properly can bring a spiritual reward. So stop whining about it and start embracing it. Here's a chance for me to be especially true to God. And that leads me to step number two. Step number two is pray your way through it because you're going to need that. Don't you think? Oh, yes. You're going to need to pray your way through it. James chapter 1, verse 5. Listen to his words. But if any of you lacks wisdom, and we do from time to time, let him ask of God. When I'm asking of God, what am I doing? I am praying. Let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Talk to the Lord about it. He will give you the strength that you need to get through it. He will bless you for going through it. There are some good things that will come out of this in your life. There are some positive things that may happen in your relationships because of the way you're going through this. So just get tough and really buckle down and say, Lord, I want to glorify you. And whenever you're feeling a little bit weak, you just pray your way through it. But you must ask in faith without any doubting. Does God answer prayer? Yes. I believe he does. Yes. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. I know the surf of the sea because I'm from California. <laughs> and I love the surf of the sea. But it does toss back and forth. For that man ought not to expect that he'll receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. If we don't pray believing, then there's something wrong with our prayer life. I mean, there is a God who is awesome and can handle every situation we face. When we pray, we need to understand who we're speaking with. What his abilities are. Pray believing. Believe what? In Believe in the goodness of God. <clears throat> Do you believe in the goodness of God? Yes. I've known people who don't believe in that. They don't believe that God is good at all. Do you believe in the wisdom of God? Yes. Then he knows what he's doing. He knows you, and he knows your situation, and he knows what's best for you. Do you believe that? Yes. Do you believe in the power of God? Oh, yes. 
that he can do whatever he wants to do? Yes. He doesn't always do what I want him to do. Yes. I and mean, that'd be really awesome from one standpoint. Oh, Lord, please don't let me have any hardship. Okay, it's gone. And he says, no, no. I'm going to teach you to grow through this thing. <laughs> so we pray. Now, maybe this situation is there for our discipline. If so, then, Lord, help me to repent of whatever it is, whatever that rough edge is on my spiritual character right now that needs to be refined. Let me know what it is so I can get that right with you. Maybe this is preparation for something. The Lord is getting you ready for something down the road. If so, please give me the strength for what's coming next. Yeah. Lord, is this a testimony? Is this happening to me so that other people can be drawn to you? If so, help me to excel to the glory of God. Pray your way through it. And every time you get a little frustrated and things are not going as, as well as you'd like for them to be, you just pray and you trust God and you know he's in control and you're not in control. You can't change those things. So you just got to learn to live with them. But it's easier to live with them if you are living with God. Amen. James chapter 1 verse 12. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. Now, it says man, but I believe it means mankind, all men and women. For those in our time that can't understand the difference or whatever. <laughs> blessed is a man or a woman who perseveres under trial. You're going to be blessed. God will bless you if you are persevering and growing and maturing through that trial. If you're doing it to the, way, to the glory of God, then you're going to be blessed because of it. For once he's been approved, he will receive the crown of life. There is a crown waiting for you if you go through hardship. Lord, bring on hardship then. Not a lot. Not severe, but give me a little something here and there so that I can maybe receive the crown of life. Which the Lord has promised to everyone who loves him. Do you love him? Yes. Pray your way through it. Step number three. Avoid the pitfalls. And there are some pitfalls out there for us living in this world. Do you know that? Yes. James chapter 1, verse 9. The pastor knew it. But the brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position. What does he mean when he says the brother of humble circumstances? Someone who doesn't have a lot of what? Money. He is a person of humble circumstances. He doesn't have the kind of money that he can just do whatever he wants to do and spend money here and there. And when you go to visit his home, it, you know, it's not a mansion. He's living in a little hut somewhere. Humble circumstances. And God says he should glory in his high position because you know what? God holds those folks who go through such hardship, he holds them in high esteem. They're important to his kingdom. In fact, you're going to find a lot more of them in heaven than the ones on the other, other end of the spectrum. Amen. Those who live their lives in extreme wealth, many of them will never feel the need for God. So there's a man of humble circumstances. Verse 10, And the rich man is to glory in his humiliation, because like flowering grass, he will pass away. Now, we'll all pass away, but this man who thinks he's so wonderful and nothing could ever go bad for him, he's going to pass away someday. The money's going to be gone. Yeah. All of the luxury, all of the joy, everything that he in, was, was so important to him. Go to the next verse, if you would. For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass, and its flower falls off, and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. In the midst of his pursuits. While he is still striving for more, while he's planning to have more, thinking what he's going to do when he has more money to do those things. And in the middle of all that pursuit, he's going to pass away, stand before God and find out he has lived his life in futility. Oh, hallelujah. It's going to fade away. So for the poor man, his pitfall often is self-pity. 
feel sorry for himself because he doesn't have anything. Mm -hmm. And so he complains. Oh, woe is me, woe is me. We spend so much time commiserating about what we do not have. We feel that life is unfair. We can become bitter. Can we not? That's true. And angry with God. Mm -hmm. Are there people in this world that are angry with God? Mm -hmm. You better believe it. Is every poor person angry with God? No. Mm -hmm. There are some who love God and they say, I couldn't live this life unless I had him. That's right. But I do have him. And so this pitfall of feeling sorry for ourselves, that does not promote our spiritual life, does not bring glory to God. The brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position, recognizing that his high position is one before the throne of God. That's where his high position is. And boy, what's, what excitement it's going to be for that person someday. When they die and find themselves in the presence of God, and he says, hey, I've got a mansion for you. Come over here and see this. And you open up those gates and walk down those golden streets, and you see this magnificent place, something you could never, ever dream of being here unless you're outside the gate begging for food. And here you are. This is your apartment. God's provided it for you. And you think, oh, me? Lord, me? I don't, I'm not worthy of that. Oh, this is for you. Self-pity. You have the opportunity to trust God every day and never get sidetracked by the pursuit of riches. Self-sufficiency can run contrary to the daily life of faith. What's the pitfall for the rich man? Well, it's pride. He doesn't need God. He can get so comfortable that he fails to realize that God has blessed him with everything he's got. And instead of becoming generous and helping others because of how God has blessed him, he hoards it to himself and thinks that he is somehow worthy of all these things, that he's done this for himself, that he's earned his way. And he gets so prideful. And someday he's going to die and it's all going to be gone. He's not going to find a mansion in the palace that God has prepared. He's going to find a place that he can never recover from. To whom much is given, the Bible says, much is required. Neither self-pity nor pride are endearing to God. Neither one improves our testimony to a lost world, so avoid the pitfalls. Why would he bring that, that, that up? Because he's seeing people in front of him going through both things, both of those. And it concerns him. Step number four. Yes, we will get out of here before lunch. Depends on if you enjoy a late lunch. <laughs> Step number four, beware of temptation. Beware of temptation. What does temptation have to do with all of this? Temptation is always a danger because the tempter has his eyes set on you. Mm -hmm. And oh boy, would he like to distract you. It's one of the devil's favorite forms of attack is to mislead you, to lie to you, to deceive you and to tempt you with other things. It's difficult for us sometimes to argue with that when it's right there in front of our face. Oh, it won't hurt you to have some fun. Have a little fun in your life for crying out loud, right? Now, I'm not saying that if you're a Christian you can never have fun. I'm saying that the devil wants to emphasize fun so much that you never have a Christian life. That's what I'm saying. If he can't beat you into submission, he will tempt you into sin. And he will laugh at you, and he will criticize you before the throne of God because of how, how you have failed. And there's people in the Bible who had that very experience. Don't we know that? James chapter 1, verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. God doesn't tempt you to do something stupid. If you did something stupid, you came up with that yourself. You can thank yourself for that one, because God didn't give you that thought. He didn't go, hey, by the way, Keith, if you would do that. God doesn't do that. He gives us clear direction on the right path. But the devil, on the other hand... Mm -hmm. Acts like he's your best buddy in the whole wide world. And, oh, what's, what's it going to hurt to have a little bit of fun? 
So God is not the one that's tempting you. Each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust, which says to me, it's a very personal thing. What is your hang-up? What are your weaknesses? What, where are you temptable? Does that make sense? Because there are some things the devil could tempt me with. He would never. He could tempt me with alcohol for the rest of my life, and it would never bother me a bit because I've never had a drink, and I don't intend to. So I can walk into a bar and talk to someone about the Lord. It doesn't bother me if there's alcohol there. It's just not a place where the devil can tempt me. Now, I'm not going to share with you areas where he could. <laughs> but we all have areas of weakness, do we not? And when the devil finds out what that is, you can be sure he will attack you every moment he can to try to destroy your spiritual life and your relationship with God. God does not tempt us. The enemy tempts us. To tempt means to test one maliciously, craftily. That's what the devil does. To try or test one's faith, one's virtue, one's character by enticing them to sin. God never entices someone to sin, correct? Right. More Christian lives are damaged by temptation rather than trials. Because we're so easy. Uh, the devil just sits back and felt so easy. Man, once he knows where you're weak, oh, it's so easy. I can get you. I can nail you with some things and, and you will really mess up your life. So resist temptation to sin. How do I know it's sin? Read the book. That helps. Yeah. Listen to the Spirit of God. He'll tell you, Keith, you don't need that. He's told me that before. Uh, Keith, clean up your attitude. Uh, Keith, that person is probably not a very helpful friend for you right now. Because there's a lot of things going on. And the fact is, God isn't tempting me. He is leading me in the righteous path. But the devil's trying to get me off that path every moment of every day. Resist him. Don't let him tempt you. And then finally, step number five. Stay true to the word of God. Obey God's word. You don't have to understand it to obey it. You don't have to be able to explain it to your friends to obey it. You just need to know that God is God and he has spoken. And when he speaks, we need to listen. And not just listen, we need to do what he says. And if we will do that, we will be blessed. Not just in the future, but right here, we will be blessed. If we just stay true to the word of God. Verse 21. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility, receive the word implanted. What word is that? It's the word of God. Yes. Which is able to save your souls. But prove yourselves, what? Doers. Doers of the word. Not merely hearers who delude themselves. There's a lot of people who hear the word. Moses heard the word on the mountain. Mm -hmm. Hear what God said. But he was so ticked off with the people, he did something else. I understand that. I just know that he was wrong in doing that. And as a pastor, if I were to be so ticked off at the congregation, I do some things that do not glorify God. It's not going to help me. He's not going to bless me for that. So I have to deal with my side of that issue, and that is to listen to God and to obey his commands. Yes? Yeah. Verse 23. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. And once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But the one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. You believe that? Yeah. What's the road to blessing? Listen to God and follow him. Mm -hmm. Learn the voice of the devil and the games that he plays, and reject him. See, there are certain things that if we apply them to our lives in our daily routine, we can grow and mature, and we can bless God, and we can bless those around us. Well, there's nothing more beautiful than to see a life that's been lived in commitment to Christ. My mom and dad were like that. In fact, 
I mentioned to you the other day about a, an encounter over the internet with one of my brothers who's had a problem with alcoholism and drug abuse and stuff his entire life. It's been a mess, and I feel for him. I love him, he's my brother. But he keeps going back to it, and it just destroys his life. And he's trying to get sober again, and so I sent him just a message about the Lord and, and the fact that God can help him overcome that and we can work through this. There's not a sin that you've committed that God is not willing to forgive and just trying to encourage him to get on the path on, with God. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I said, we can work through this. And his response was, let's not and say we did. <laughs> now, I didn't have a very spiritual response to that. <laughs> so I didn't write anything. I just said, God, this kid still isn't ready. All of the misery in his life, all the alcohol and what it's done to him over the years, and he's still not ready to let God have a chance in his life. And so he was angry, and I thought, well. Then one of my other brothers recently wrote a note to him over the Internet, and he said to him, think about it. If you believed what he believes, would you not want your family and friends to be blessed? He's doing what he believes is best for you. And my other brother said, oh, I can see that. Duh. <laughs> Welcome to the party. <laughs> Obey God. Follow his commandments. He will bless you. James started right where those people were living. Trials and temptation every stinking day but we can live through it and we can glorify god amen? amen amen stand with me please we're going to sing an invitation hymn you may not i should have done it i'm going to be drinking water otherwise i can't wrap up this message we'll be here all day because you're not getting doors are locked until i finish oh that's much better one of the blessings of this congregation, I believe, is the opportunity for us to minister to people who are senior adults. Because we have special interests and needs sometimes. We have a need for fellowship. We need friends. We need Christian support. That's important. And I'm meeting more and more people at Walmart and other places. There's a lady that we were talking to her the other day. She said, I'm 90 years old. She said, I just moved into the area, and I, I hate it here. She said, I'm, Fort, I'm from Fort Worth, and that's where all my friends are. I said, well, do you have a church? She said, well, no. So I started talking to her, and she said, Could, I don't have transportation. Could you pick me up? I said, where do you live? She lives a block from me. One block. I said, yeah, I think we could pick you up. <laughs> she couldn't come today because her son, who must be 70, I guess, he's 90, uh, came to see her because he's not feeling well and she's nursing him back to health. 90 year old. Wow. So maybe the son needed that nursing. But anyway, she's going to come and be with us. There are people out there, there are seniors out there that when they get into a lot of churches, first of all, they don't feel comfortable with the music and all the other things. And they also feel like they're pretty much dismissed or discarded or they're kind of invisible to the people around them. Not here. We love old people. We love old people. We are. And we love to have more and more of them with us so that this fellowship can grow and we can minister to one another. You need friends? These are your friends. 